my name is Asa. I'm an engineer working on Celo. Uh, and I'm here to tell you a bit about Celo's stability protocol so that you can help build it, uh, build on top of it, and potentially participate in it. Um, so what are we going to be covering today? Um, I'm going to start by talking briefly about Celo's mission and the motivation for building a stablecoin protocol. Then I'll go into an overview of the Celo protocol, uh, including kind of where it lies within the context of the broader stablecoin landscape. Then I'll describe a model for simulating uh, this protocol and share some results. Uh, after that, I have a special announcement uh, that I'm excited to share with you all uh, for the first time. And then finally, time permitting, uh, we can get into Q&A. Um, so before we dive into the details of the Celo Stability Protocol, uh, I think it really makes sense to start with the purpose for which it was built. So Celo's mission is to build a monetary system that creates the conditions of prosperity for all. That's a wildly ambitious mission, and one that we've been working on for a few years now, and expect to continue to work on for years to come. And it's not the sort of thing that's just going to happen overnight. You know, um, um, There's no kind of one killer technology breakthrough that's going to make this happen. Uh, it's going to happen incrementally. And we believe that kind of a good first step in this direction is developing a sound currency that users can send easily and receive easily um, via cheap, widely available mobile phones uh, running uh, applications like the Celo wallet, um, kind of pictured here on the right. And so let me tell you a bit more about how the stability protocol works. Um, and to do so, I think it makes, start, or makes sense to start with kind of a high-level overview of the existing stablecoin landscape. Um, broadly, there are three types of um, stablecoins. Uh, first, there are fiat collateralized stablecoins. Um, so an example here that you might be familiar with is Tether. Fiat collateralized stablecoins generally kind of act as IOU tokens. So you take uh, some fiat currency, say US dollars, send it to a centralized third party. They give you uh, some IOU tokens in return. Uh, and then if you want your fiat back, well, you just give them the IOU tokens and they give you your fiat. Um, and so I think these are like kinds of currencies are often maligned uh, in the industry, but I think kind of unfairly, because there's something really effective about this um, from a stability perspective. Uh, and that's that there's a very, very uh, simple and direct arbitrage cycle that exists when the price of the token deviates from its peg. So for example, if the price of um, you know, one of these IOU tokens were to rise above its peg, uh, it, there's an easy way to profit uh, that pushes the price back down. You simply take some fiat currency, uh, send it to this third party, get your IOU tokens in return, and then sell those IOU tokens for more fiat currency than you started with. Uh, and this process of selling those IOU tokens pushes the price back towards one. Um, however, <laughs> you know, they're maligned for a reason, uh, and this is that they're not very decentralized. You have to trust this centralized third party um, and you kind of rely on um, regulation, uh, regular audits, that sort of thing, to kind of build and maintain this trust. Um, furthermore, the redemption process can be slow and expensive. Uh, it also often requires like a wire transfer, and so there's some efficiencies lost there. Next, we have um, crypto collateralized stablecoins. Uh, Unlike fiat collateralized stablecoins, they are collateralized by crypto. Um, I think the obvious example here is Maker. These things are kind of often done using loan instruments, uh, like in Maker, where you kind of put up some collateral, 
and are able to borrow stable tokens in return. And so the obvious win here is that these systems are more decentralized than their fiat-based alternatives, um, but it comes at a few costs. Uh, one, complexity. Uh, so it's, you know, these things are typically more complex. Um, two is uh, the requirement of over-collateralization due to kind of volatility in the underlying collateral. Um, and three, you typically don't have this uh, direct arbitrage cycle that you get with fiat collateralized stable coins. Um, and so, you know, stability may be a bit worse uh, as a result. Finally, we have seniorage style stable coins. Uh, and these algorithmically expand or contract the supply of the stable token by using a new uh, token, usually called the seniorage token. Um, this token may fluctuate in value and is designed to kind of shift volatility risk from stable token holders to seniorage token holders. You could argue that these systems are the most decentralized. Uh, because they actually, you know, they don't depend on fiat, there's no trusted third party, and there's not even, uh, I guess, an additional cryptocurrency outside of this system that's needed uh, to stabilize the token. Um, but in general, they're unproven, uh, complex, and potentially kind of vulnerable to, uh, like, death spirals when there's a lack of confidence uh, in the system or in kind of cryptocurrencies more broadly. And so the reason I am kind of went over these three kinds of stable coins is because uh, what we tried to do with Celo is capture some of the best characteristics of all three. Uh, and so what I would actually describe our approach as a bit of a hybrid uh, between the three. And so I'll kind of reference back to these as I explain the protocol. Um, and when explaining the protocol, it really makes sense to start with the reserve. So um, there is a reserve. Uh, it holds Celo Gold, which is the native token of the Celo platform, as well as a diversified basket of non-Celo crypto assets. The reserve is rebalanced regularly according to some uh, target asset allocations uh, that can be set via a decentralized governance mechanism that's kind of out of the scope of this talk. Um, and the reserve is really used to stabilize kind of stable coins on the Celo platform. Uh, the Celo dollar kind of being the uh, prototypical example. And it really only works well to stabilize these tokens if the value of the reserve uh, is at least the value of all of the kind of issued stable coins, right? If you're under collateralized, you know, you're prone to a run on the reserve um, where you can't, you know, if suddenly everybody decides they want to, you know, they no longer want your stable coin, uh, you're not going to be able to hold the peg. And so this ratio between the value of assets in the reserve and the value of the stable tokens uh, that are issued uh, is what we call the reserve ratio. And there are mechanisms built into the protocol to protect the reserve ratio when it seems in danger of going below one. Uh, the first is a variable transfer fee on Celo Gold, um, which goes directly to the reserve. Uh, the second is diversion of epoch rewards. So this is Celo Gold that's kind of given out uh, periodically uh, through inflation, and we can divert that from its regular recipients to the reserve. Uh, and finally, uh, the protocol can leverage uh, demerage charge on existing stable coins. And so I mentioned that the reserve can be used to stabilize, um, you know, stable coins, but I didn't actually explain how that works. Uh, and it does so via something that we call a decentralized one-to-one -one mechanism. And here we drew inspiration from fiat collateralized stablecoins. Uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, users can create new Celo dollars 
by sending one US dollar's worth of Celo gold to a decentralized exchange. And similarly, they can burn Celo dollars by redeeming them for one US dollar's worth of gold. Um, and this should be very familiar to kind of what we just talked about with fiat collateralized stable coins, except instead of fiat, fiat being on one end, uh, it's Celo gold. And this creates very direct incentives for kind of expanding and contracting supply of Celo dollars uh, as kind of demand changes. So for example, on the right here, uh, we have kind of an example of a contraction cycle. So you can imagine where demand for the cello dollar falls, and so too does the price. Now it's only 95 cents. Users can take one US dollar, buy one dollar's worth of gold, trade it with this decentralized exchange for one cello dollar, take that cello dollar, sell it on the market, um, Whoops, sorry, I went in the wrong direction. That is what you would do if uh, the price was too high. If it's too low, you take your dollar, or you take 95 cents, buy a cello dollar, exchange it for one, cello do one US dollar's worth of gold, sell that gold on an exchange for one US dollar, and now you have a dollar uh, in exchange for the 95 cent investment that you started with. Uh, and in doing so, you've pushed the price back up, right? The first step was buy a cello dollar, pushes the price up. Um, this is what I just accidentally described. If the price is too high, um, what you can do is you take your US dollar, buy one dollar's worth of cello gold, trade it with the reserve for one cello dollar, and sell that cello dollar for one US dollar and five cents. And so here again, you have a very direct ability to profit via arbitrage, uh, in a way that pushes the price of the cello dollar back towards its peg. Uh, and one advantage that this actually has over fiat collateralized stable coins is that no part of this arbitrage cycle uh, involves a wire transfer. So it can actually be done in a much faster manner. Uh, if you've been paying attention, uh, you might note that the, uh, this whole mechanism is rather sensitive to the oracleized price of cello gold. So if an attacker were able to gain control of the oracle, they could set the cello gold price to nearly zero and then trade kind of a trivial, trivial amount of cello dollars uh, in exchange for quite a large amount of cello gold. Uh, fortunately, we have a mechanism to uh, mitigate this risk uh, that is inspired by Uniswap. So instead of taking the entire reserve and making that available to exchange, uh, only a small portion of it is carved out at any given time for exchanges. Uh, and that portion is used to kind of set up a Uniswap system such that if trading activity is heavily imbalanced and very high in volume, there is a negative feedback mechanism um, to mitigate kind of the potential long-term um, stability degrading effects of a, an attack in which the oracle is manipulated. Um, and so hopefully you're familiar with Uniswap. I, uh, if not, I guess maybe this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Basically the idea is that you kind of have two buckets of currencies uh, and you try to keep the product of the two the same. Uh, the price winds up being the ratio of the two, and so if there's extreme kind of buying pressure on one end or the other, uh, the price of that asset is going to go up, and that's the kind of negative feedback loop that I was talking about. And so this is kind of the entire stability protocol in a nutshell at a high level. Um, these things are rather complex, and so it's not really safe to just trust your gut that like, oh yeah, I thought about all the kind of edge cases and this works. Um, so what we did was we modeled it and simulated it under kind of various adverse conditions uh, to kind of get more reliance that this actually uh, is able to hold a peg. So I'll go into that. First, we model the cello dollar demand which we do via a geometric Brownian motion. Um, so the geometric Brownian motion is nice here because you can easily parameterize it. Um, kind of you just choose your 
volatility and your expected growth. Um, it's nice because it grows kind of uh, proportionally to its current value, which is, or grows or shrinks according to its current value, which is kind of what you'd want uh, in a model like this. Uh, and then it can never go below zero, which you know, makes sense for demand for a currency. Uh, we also add kind of uh, discontinuous jumps to this model uh, via the Merton uh, jump diffusion model. So this is to model things like, you know, the response in demand to a zero day exploit, right? You would expect kind of a precipitous drop. Uh, and so we kind of include uh, these sorts of discontinuities in our model. Uh, this image on the right is, uh, you know, some example paths that are generated by this type of model uh, for various kind of expected growth rates over 30 years. Uh, next, we need to model uh, the reserve, and we start with the kind of non-gold section of it. Uh, oh, mu. Um, sorry, mu is the kind of expected annual growth rate. Um, so this is, uh, you know, we have a mu of 20%, 10%, and negative 10% as examples here. Uh, and so that's the expected annual growth of these assets. Uh, however, you know, there's quite a bit of volatility. I'm actually not sure what the vol volatility parameter was for this particular figure. Um, so it means that, you know, uh, even in the example, right, where mu is 10%, we have, you know, many paths that over 30 years, you know, decline. Um, good question. Uh, so after modeling the demand for cello dollars, we model the reserve, starting with the non cello gold crypto asset part of the reserve. Here again, we use a geometric Brownian motion, but because there are multiple assets in the reserve, uh, we use a multivariate geometric Brownian motion. Uh, and again, we kind of add jumps to this. Uh, the difference here being we have two kinds of jumps. We have jumps for individual assets, uh, and we have market-wide jumps that affect all of the assets. And so here again on the right, uh, we have some example paths for the kind of relative value of the non-gold uh, portion of the reserve for uh, expected annual growth rates of 20%, 10%, zero, uh, and negative 20%. Um, and again, I'm sorry, I'm not sure what the kind of sigmas here are, um, but it, clearly there is quite a bit of volatility. Um, so that's one part of the reserve. We need to model the rest of it, um, and that's the cello gold portion. And so cello gold is modeled as the sum of uh, two uh, discounted cash flows here in order to evaluate kind of the stability of the, the protocol. Uh, so the first uh, discounted cash flow is for the expansion value of cello gold. So as kind of we walked through earlier, uh, whenever the price of the cello dollar deviates from the peg, there is an arbitrage opportunity that holders of cello gold are able to exploit. And that's what uh, we kind of factor in when we measure this expansion value. So you can actually think of that uh, or model that as a discounted cash flow. Uh, and similarly, uh, there's utility value of cello gold, and this is just its value for use as a transaction fee token. Um, and so this value is really just a function of transaction velocity and fee size. So now that we've kind of modeled all of the kind of bits and pieces of our system, uh, it's time to kind of put the, them together into a simulation. Uh, and this is how it works. It runs iteratively uh, every day. And each day, these are the steps that are executed. So first, we update the cello dollar market cap value, which we generated earlier with the geometric Brownian motion. Then we model the value of the reserve, both the non cello gold and the cello gold portion. Then we calculate the cello dollar cello gold exchange rates. And uh, very importantly, there are two exchange rates here. There is the on-chain exchange rate, 
which is simply says, you know, you can take one US dollars worth of cello gold and trade it for one cello dollar. And there is the off-chain exchange rate. And that's what kind of the market price is, right? And so the off-chain exchange rate can deviate from that peg. And when it does, in our simulation, we assume that uh, users will take advantage of those arbitrage opportunities and push these two exchange rates back towards each other until they reach an equilibrium. And as a result, the cello dollar supply will have expanded or contracted. And once we have that updated cello dollar supply in response to this, on, this like trading activity, we can calculate the price of the cello dollar just as a function of the total market cap, which we got in step one, and the supply, which we you know, updated in step four. Uh, then periodically we rebalance the reserve, rinse and repeat, and do this over 30 years, um, and then over many different selection of various growth settings uh, and volatility settings, and then you know, over hundreds and hundreds of iterations. And these are the results that we get. Uh, I understand that this figure, or the caption is hard to read, so I'll walk you through it. Uh, the z-axis is the average absolute value of the deviation between the cello gold price and one US dollar. So this is basically how much has the cello dollar depegged. The lower uh, left axis is the expected annual growth in the crypto markets. So not cello gold, but the kind of non cello gold portion of the reserve. And that ranges from averaging 20% losses to averaging 20% gains, or rather expecting 20% losses and expecting 20% gains. Uh, and then in the lower right, we have the um, ex expected growth in the demand for the cello dollar. And this is ranging from negative 10% in expectation uh, all the way to 20%. And the two surfaces that you're seeing are different choices of volatility for the growth in demand for cello dollars. Uh, so the lower one is uh, volatility of 20%, the upper one is volatility of 40%. And as you would expect, kind of the worst case scenario, the worst depegging comes in the far upper left, and that's where uh, the crypto markets are tanking, and the demand for cello dollars is tanking, and demand for cello dollars is very volatile. And even in this kind of trifecta of unfriendly conditions, the protocol is able to kind of on average uh, keep within two and a bit cents of the peg, uh, which we think is really impressive. And under more favorable conditions, you know, you're looking at an average DPEG of around a penny, um, which we think is quite tolerable for a medium exchange currency, and we feel that this protocol is a really sound basis on which to build a medium exchange currency uh, for those that need it most. As I mentioned before, I have a special announcement. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, as of today, we're excited to announce the Great Cello Stake Off. Yeah, that's the reaction I wanted. Um, the, yeah, the Stake Off is our first incentivized testnet uh, where users and prospective validators can come interact with the protocol and compete to earn uh, gold on the Cello mainnet. Uh, more details can be found at cello.org slash stakeoff, uh, so please check that out. Uh, I'm also going to shamelessly plug our Taco Tuesday event, which is happening right across the street at Blue Stem uh, Brasserie. Uh, we're hosting in conjunction with She256, um, which is started out of Berkeley, uh, and I think all the details are there, but it's starting around 5.30, and we'd love to have you join us. Uh, there will be tacos and drinks. Yes. I'm sorry? Backed by gold? They're not backed by gold, to my knowledge. Uh, <laughs> not yet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, do we, I don't know how much time we have for questions. 
one or two questions, um, I'll, but I'll be available after, and I'll be available across the street and online at solo.org and at solo HQ. Oh, sorry. No, please. Sorry, Dimitri here. Um, the two arbitrage cycles that you mentioned, mm -hmm. I think one of them is predicated on people being willing to have enough, be, having enough cello dollars to be sold, right? So that the price can go down? Um, yes, so that is, let's see. So you're saying that, um, Sorry, it seems to me that you do need to make sure that you have at least twice as much, uh, uh, I'm confused now, but like twice as much of that as anybody else, right? You have to match everybody else's so that the arbitrage cycles you mentioned are always available, right? So that people can make that arbitrage. Yeah. But, so that's like, a, you have to have twice, no, you have to match everybody else's reserves. So you, in some sense, you have to hold half the currency at all times. I don't know that that exactly is true. Um, I th what you, so uh, in the expansion cycle, at, at least, um, you are kind of minting the, like, the exchange is able to create new cello dollars, so there's not a problem there. Uh, what the real problem can be is in this kind of lower left-hand quadrant where you need to buy cello gold. Um, there does need to be enough cello gold on the market in order to create uh, new cello dollars in order to expand the supply. Um, and that is something that we take into account in the simulation. We were mainly concerned when it came to stability about two things. Um, not enough liquidity in the market in order to react to changes in demand. And so that's something that we do explicitly model. Um, and that is where depegging occurs. Um, yeah, that's, I guess that's the main one. Uh, and so we, we do explicitly model. Uh, kind of liquidity on both sides to make sure there is a match, and sometimes there isn't. Thank you so much, Asa. And once again, because of time, I just want to thank you for presenting. This was excellent. Uh, round of applause, please, if you would.